Okay, well, uh, we're well into our time, but I, I just kind of want to get you back since we've been away from this, and I know you had a great speaker last week. I've heard really exciting things, and we were going, ah, I missed it. But I have kind of stayed up a little bit with what he was doing, so uh, it was fun to hear that, that things are progressing. But I got just kind of a brain opener for us this morning. I don't know how many of you heard have heard of a thing called uh, Rosetta. You've all heard of the Rosetta Stone, but I don't know if you've heard of Rosetta Spacecraft. There's a picture of it. Rosetta Spacecraft is a spacecraft that was shipped out 10 years ago from the Earth by the European Union, and its uh, mission is to rendezvous with a comet. And it has a an interesting pattern, and you're all going, what has this got to do with Sunday school? Trust me, we'll get there. Here is the little, here is the pattern that it is, if you'll, you can sort of make it out, there's a little circle around the Earth, they've launched it into orbit around the Earth, it's using like a little slingshot, slung it out there, it went around Mars, picked up from the gravitational pull of Mars, grabbed some velocity, shot it back around the Earth, and out into deep space, and the little bottom white dot you see there, at that point they put it to sleep. And they sent it on its trajectory, and it's been in hibernation for a number of years. And what it's done is gone all the way out through the solar system, and it's looping around, and it's going to, it has intercepted the, the uh, circle, if you will, the ellipse that, of this comet, and I wrote it down, comet for your information, it's a Russian name I cannot pronounce, but it's 67P, one particular comet that they have, and there is the photograph of it as this thing has entered the, an orbit <coughs> around it, as this comet is running out there at 34,000 miles an hour, this comet was intercepted by the satellite, they are now orbiting it in an ever closer orbit. There's a nice little close-up of this rock. Looks like a dumbbell out there. It's kind of tumbling through space. The ultimate goal is there's a little landing unit on this spacecraft. It's going to launch off of there when it gets just the right place, and they're going to plop it down somewhere, I think maybe about where you're looking at right there. They're going to land this little lander on this comet, and the goal is then to evaluate what's made of and all that sort of thing, just like our Mars landers. Is that incredible or what? And the question for you that's trying to get us back into this study this morning as we come into Lamentations and all that, is how in the world, if you go back to that orbit deal, how in the world is that possible? How is it possible that over a span of 10 years and longer, but it's been 10 years up to now, that this thing, that you can send a thing out around the Earth, around the planet, and out into deep space, and have it circle around and intercept something that only comes around past the sun and our, into our part of the world once in a great, great while. How is that possible? Why does that work? It's because the universe is laid out in mathematics. Because it's, it's like a clock. If you know it's here and you can do the calculations and if you, your math is good enough, which it obviously is, they know and that thing is going to be exactly where it's supposed to be, when it's supposed to be there, and it's in you every time. And so you can fire it off 10 years out, you know in 10 years exactly, you can calculate where that's going to be. Why is that so? It's because it's not an accident, I believe. These things weren't just thrown out there randomly, and we don't live in chaos. We, use, we live in this cosmos, this universe, where everything holds together. And why is that important to our study this morning? Is because the nation of Israel, and often us, and the reason we're in Lamentations, they have forgotten who their God is. And they have forgotten a lot of things about Him, and they have forgotten the things that he told them. And, and we somehow, because we deal with it on a regular basis, and we get into this routine of Sunday school and church and all those things, we tend to forget who is this person, who is this God that we worship, and it just becomes kind of a thing to us. And I'm afraid that's what happened to the nation of Israel. It started out with just a little bit of familiarity, maybe over familiarity, and it got to be routine, 
and they forgot who they were to worship. And so we find ourselves in chapter 2 with the title on my chapter 2 of Lamentations that's been inserted, God's Anger Over Israel. And we have actually been looking in chapter 1 a lot at the man's view, looking at Israel, looking at Judah, to Judah in particular, and Jerusalem, and saying, oh my gosh, here's what it looks like. In chapter 2, we get a little more divine viewpoint of, oh my gosh, here's what it looks like. And that's what we've been working our way through. In keeping with our tradition, even though the hour is uh, moving on, uh, I want to read at least a portion of this. Uh, so let's read at least through uh, chapter 6. And I want to... I might have to go through seven. Her chapter, I mean verse... Uh, let's read through verse eight. I, I need to at least go that far. Just to kind of get you into the rhythm a little bit. And then we'll pick up with a couple things that we'll try to go. So chapter two of Lamentations, if I haven't totally confused you, and we'll read one through eight or nine or something like that. How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger. He has cast from heaven to earth the glory of Israel and has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord is swallowed up. He has not spared all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath he has thrown down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought them down to the ground. He has profaned the kingdom and its princes. In fierce anger he has cut off all the strength of Israel. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. And he has burned in Jacob like a burning fire, consuming round about. He has bent his bow like an enemy. He has set his right hand like an adversary. And slain all that were pleasant to the eye in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He has poured out his wrath like a fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has destroyed its strongholds and multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and moaning. He has violently treated his tabernacle like a garden booth. He has destroyed his appointed meeting place. The Lord has caused to be forgotten the appointed feast and Sabbath in Zion, and he has despised king and priest in the indignation of his anger. The Lord has rejected his altar. He has abandoned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of an appointed feast. The Lord has determined to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not restrained his hand from destroying. And he has caused rampart and wall to lament. They have languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her kings and her princes are among the nations. The law is no more. Also her prophets find no vision from the Lord. <coughs> we'll stop right there and reading, but... Wow, that's a powerful piece of scripture. And I, I think I told some of you, I started into this study for just kind of seemed like it fit. And I have found the most, one of the most challenging studies in these few verses. And probably one of the most applicable to life right now that, that I've ever found in, in the Old Testament and been surprised by it. It's been a most interesting study. And this morning... I want to kind of step back and I want to look, it's going to be based on verses 4 and 5, but I want to look to begin with at this whole concept of how God says has become as an enemy, which is just foreign to what we usually think of. We're thinking of Jesus as our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, you know, and this relationship we have, and how can it be that God has become as an enemy? And so, the first thing that we have to look at, and as I'm studying through some of my commentaries and the comments they bring up is, when we reject Him, as Israel has done, as we've studied in our past studies, we often think that we can just go off and do our own thing, and go our own way, and it's okay. 
and so what? So we left God, we just go off. You know, it's kind of like when you do the rebellion from your parents thing. You run off away from home, I'm going to go do my thing, and mom and dad are off and gone, and my family's off and gone, and I'm just me, I do what I want to do. But God cannot simply leave us to our own devices. And there's a reason for that, and for that I need the little box thing, if you would, Kathy. When you uh, look at God, you have to remember that He is all of these things. And He's all of these things, all at the same time, and all of them have to fit together. And what we like to do is pick out the one we like right here in 1 John 4, 8, and say, God is love. And because He loves us, He loves everybody, He loves all things, and everything's wonderful, and whatever you do, it's going to be okay with God, because He's a loving God, and He understands, and He's just going to let it go. And we forget that He is also a sovereign God. He is righteous, and He's justice, and He has no option but to be that. That is what He is. And so that has to be balanced with His love. So in our idea, our kind of mushy American idea of love is that, well, if you go off, you just do your thing, sweetheart, and you be who you want to be, and it's okay. And God cannot do that because God is, first of all, He is King. He is the one who is omnipotent, and He is King of Kings above all. And because he is king, he has some things that he will have to do. And one of them, he must maintain order and restrain and punish rebellion. That's what a king has to do. To maintain the kingdom, you have to maintain order. And you must deal with those who are rebellious. So just as being a king, he is going to have to do that. He is justice up here. And so he is a judge. And so the judge cannot permit law to be trampled on, or else why would you have a judge? That's the function of the courts, right? Is their job is to make sure that people obey the law. And so if the law is what he has written down and he has placed there, you cannot stomp all over his rules with impunity. He is going to expect that you're going to follow it. And there is another thing that's kind of, these are all part of, and we tend to forget, we say it all the time, we say, our, that is in heaven, what is it? Our Father. And when we say that, that carries for us, I mean, that is there for our benefit. And, and unfortunately these days I think fatherhood and what that means is, is a little watered down in our society. However, a father who is really a father cannot abandon his children. Not going to happen. He must discipline them in their wrongdoing because he is so closely related to them. It is his flesh and blood, and he cannot let the one that is his own go run off a cliff if he can help it. I mean, you may discipline your children because they ran out in the street. Is it because it's bad to just be in the street? Or is it because you don't want them to end up being run over by the next fast car that comes by? I mean, that's it, right? So, so as a father, he can't, he's not going to just leave us to our own devices. All of these things tell us that he is going to have to act. So that is why he then becomes as an enemy. I had a note here from one of them that says, nothing, when we think about this, is God becoming as an enemy, nothing to us should be more terrible than that thought. <coughs> wow, hmm. how do you get your mind around that? Well, first of all, he is, here's this big word up here, omnipotent. You use that word every day, right? <laughs> Meaning he is all powerful and almighty. He is the maximum of strength and power that can exist anywhere in the universe. Why did I have that little thing up there today? It is his strength, it is power that not only set that into place, but it says he holds all things together by the strength of his being omnipotent. So the reason that satellite works is because he holds it all together. So if that is true, that should result, <coughs> if, that, 
If we rebel against that kind of power, what is going to be the end result of the battle? Who wins? Yeah. Yeah. It's like standing out in the freeway in the middle in front of a Mack truck and saying, Stop! Who's going to win? You know? You know, and they go, I think the Mack truck might win that battle. He is justice, as we already said, up there. That is who he is. He is therefore always right. Don't you hate that? <laughs> But something in our old sin nature rebels against that. But there is that desire to find the one who's right. He's always right. But he's also slow to anger and patient. And he's patient because he is. There's, there's one that's right, and he's always right. And one day we're going to be everything will be right. It'll all be square, and it'll all be right. But there's some confidence gained in knowing that if you go to this source, it will always be true and it will always be right. And even if in our humanness it seems wrong or out of whack, he is always right. Therefore, if you are on the opposite side from where God is, it's pretty clear that you're wrong. Does that make sense? So if your God's Word says this, and you are over here, and you're trying to find ways to explain why that's okay, you need to take it. And that gets really uncomfortable for me sometimes, because what I like to do is try to rationalize why what I'm doing is right, when, on the other hand, I'm finding out that it's wrong. And because he is love, you have to think about, and he is patient, and he is long-suffering and all that sort of thing. When the fall of Jerusalem happens and Babylon runs through that, you have to realize how fearfully wrong we must have been for God to be provoked to that. How far away from being able to be just nudged back on track we must be if he has to take that kind of extreme with us. And so it ought to give us pause when we see those kinds of things happen. And again, it was mentioned under this category, or it came under here again, he's a father. And you think about a father, and a father who loves his children, what is the last thing you want to come home and do? Discipline your children. You want to come home hug on them, grab their favorite toy, go do something with them, or do something you enjoy together. The last thing, and of course children all think, mom and dad live just to make my life miserable. <laughs> but it's not true. Mom and dad hate having to do discipline. And that's, that's part of the idea that people have that God's up there looking down on them ready to... This big ogre ready, ready to... Yeah. yeah. Just waiting for you to step out of line and... <laughs> Get it. Doesn't that fall with those who live by the law? You know, and they forget that God is grace, but it is a it's, it's both. And, and if he has to, again, if we're in this unnatural situation of him being our enemy, how fearfully wrong we must have gone to move him to that place. And well, it was an interesting quote here. It says, uh, the unnatural situation is that the wrath of the Lamb is more awful than him who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And of course that's a reference to Satan. And, he said, and remember there's a passage that's in, oh man, is it Corinthians? It says, don't fear him who can destroy the body. Fear him who can destroy the soul in, in, in the fires of hell. So to fear the wrath of the Father. Next point, this is interesting. If all these things are true about Him being a Father and all that sort of thing, God is not an enemy until we have proved ourselves enemies to Him. He isn't our, like you say, we have this view of Him as this guy waiting to drop the 
hammer on us, and it's not that case. He's the Father, the one who loves us, the one who wants a relationship for, with us. And when we have proved to be an enemy, that's when he becomes as an enemy to us. Takes us back to the box. He is something up here uh, next to the bottom one. This other word you use a lot, immutable. It mean not mutation, meaning changing, mutable. So he is never changing. So when we find ourselves with him as an enemy to us, who has changed? Who moved? We moved. God didn't move away from us. We moved away from him. So we became, he has no wish to quarrel with us. He is the one who created us. His desire was for fellowship. And since he has changed us and he is constantly of his righteousness and love, it is we are the ones that break the peace. It is interesting that it's not necessary for it to be overt and on the outside. You can be just as much an enemy of God sitting in church in the front row singing with your whole heart, well, not your whole heart, whole volume, and be just as far away from God as the person that's clear across town on the wrong side of town wants nothing to do with being in church. It's not an outside over thing. I've got a quote here. Secret alienation of the heart, quiet neglect of God's will, self-will and indifference are just as bad as overtly walking away. Secret alienation of the heart. That's what's between you and God. We have to be really careful because sometimes our hearts are deceitful as can be. And unless from the outside we get a wake-up call, sometimes it's really easy to deceive ourselves and not recognize. Therefore, why does God do what He does? Why did He do what He did to Jerusalem? Why this awfulness and lamentations? It's a wake-up call. It's the nation of Israel. Look where you are. See where you are. Come back. For his, he leads us down. Psalm 23. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Because that's where he is. He is righteous. That's who he is. It's for his name's sake. Yeah. That's where he leads us. This one was interesting to me. This is a quote. Though God become like an enemy, he will not really be your enemy. Did you catch that? He says he has become, it tells us here, he's become as an enemy or like an enemy. He is acting in a way that looks like an enemy, but it's not that he is one. Again, he will not hate, he will never hate the one he's created. We tend to put our own feelings and stuff in there and we say, boy, this person does that to me. They're out. I hate their guts, whatever, I can't stand them, they're out, they're my enemy, I hate them. You look at the Babylonians that came into town, they had hate for the nation that they conquered. They were gleeful over what they had done, but God's not. Tell what we were told, the apparent enmity or the apparent animosity is fearful because the things we've talked about, when you understand who God is and that appearance of His wrath and His anger pointed our direction, it's scary. What we need to try to re understand is that those things are motivated by His character up here. It's just that our idea of love is kind of mushy and squishy 
and not very firm in his idea of love is that I will do what it takes and what it costs to bring my people back. And if it takes being as an enemy, then I will do what's necessary. And what was necessary is our last point in this one. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. If you would just turn it all the way back there to me, for me. It's way back there in the back of your Bible after Hebrews. First John chapter two. I should have put my marker in there today. First John two. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the, there's that big word, propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And everybody that uses that big word every day knows that you were at war, and you have, when you settle with your enemy, and have reached this state of propitiation, means you have peace. So he has become like an enemy, and now you are at peace because of the work of this one that's our advocate. And how is that? He has made peace because of our sin, for our sins, and not ours, but for those of the whole world. He paid the price to take care of the problem that made God become as an enemy to us because our sin stood in the way of who he is. How can one who is absolutely righteous be in the presence of sin that hasn't been paid for? Because the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. You cannot have sin in the presence of a righteous God. And his justice requires that it has to be the, the law has to be carried out. All these things work together. It can never change. It's always got to be that way. But it's absolutely true. All those things say something had to be done. And this is where love kicks in. Is when the Savior steps up and says, I'll do it. I will take their place and I will bring peace that they don't have. Man, it's amazing. That's in Lamentations. Can you believe it? I just blew me away. And that's just a couple of verses. Next time, the ones I was going to get to and the rest of today that I never got to. Sorry about that. We're going to look at his rejected altar and what that means. And then we may look at a little thing, a no vision from the Lord that pops up there in verse 9 and again 14. I want to take a look at those two things and say, what, what is he trying to tell us? What does that mean? But it's amazing to me that in this woe is you, Jerusalem, that I just thought this big, big lament, a big, oh gosh, boo-hoo sort of thing, is the very core of the gospel message. It's right there. So let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning in your word. And we thank you that no matter where we go, in your word that's been preserved all these centuries for us, we find truth. Because that's what you are. That's who you are as part of you, that, that you are truth. Father, help us not to drift away from that truth. It is easy to, uh, with our old sin natures, to grasp what we want to be and do what we want to do, whether it lines up with what you say in your word or not. It is just uh, seems to have been wired into us from the, from the fall in the garden. And uh, until that is removed from us uh, and we're glorified, it will be a constant battle that we face. Father, we ask for your grace to, uh, 
to give us that tap on the shoulder or kick in the seat, whatever it is that it takes, as our Father to, uh, to get our attention, to cause us to see where we are and to turn and come back and be close to our Father again. Thank you, Father, for the Savior who recognized that we weren't able to meet the demands uh, that your holiness expected of us, and he was willing to step in and to uh, remove that barrier between us. Father, thank you for our time this morning, uh, for your word that has uh, made itself uh, available to us, and uh, just give us ears to hear today. Help us to apply it in our lives as we go through our week.